guys about fever in the little infant. By little, I mean uh, mostly less than three months. So in preparation for this talk, um, you know, I was talking to a few residents, primarily interns, a couple of them uh, from the ED background and a couple of them from the BEATS background. Some of you may be here. Uh, I gave them like a hypothetical case. And again, this is a purely hypothetical case. No resemblance to any patient that you might have seen you know, is there. And if it is, then it's purely coincidental. So we'll talk about it. So this is a case that I pretty much you know, gave uh, to the interns and asked them what they would do or what their thoughts and opinions would be. So this is a two-month-old baby boy born by a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery, full term, no pre- or postnatal complications, presented to the pediatric PD with fever for one day, rectal temperature at home was 102, mother said you know, the baby has no other complaints and the baby's been doing well, gaining weight and no other uh, problems. Baby got his two-month-old vaccines this morning. General appearance, the baby's alert, active, um, you know, well-responsive, happy, vitals are all stable except, you know, a temperature of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. H-E-N-T normal, chest, uh, cardiovascular exam normal, no, um, no abnormalities on abdominal exam, and neurological good tone, suck, normal reflexes. So I'll just share with you uh, what, you know, I got as far as from residents. So first resident, I think it is very hard to base the outcome of such a little baby purely on history and physical exam. I would do a complete sepsis workup. Uh, resident two, the baby seems to be doing well. I think reassurance is enough. Resident three, I just want to put Dr. Tijani in blog. I know this answer. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> and resident four, the baby just received vaccines. I would assume the fever is due to the vaccine, so I would not really work up this baby. And mind you, these are all real responses. I didn't need this up. Resident five, since this is a two month old baby, I would do a partial sepsis workup, which would include a CTC blood culture, UA urine culture, and a chest x ray. Resident six, I think doing a partial sepsis workup and maybe giving a dose of ceftriaxone, not sure about the disposition, uh, maybe admit. The nurse overhears our conversation and Rika, is this correct? I mean, the baby just got vaccines. Why would we do blood work? The fever is obviously due to the vaccines. And so on and so forth. The debate continues. So that made me think about the objectives about our, for our talk, which would be to identify fever in the newborn, <coughs> discuss variation in practice in the febrile infant, review low risk criteria, review workup for neonates and young infants, and um, just briefly on a you know, couple of special uh, situations where you know babies that come who've, had, who've been on prior antibiotic or who have concomitant viral infections. So fever, it is one of the most common chief complaints in the pediatric ED. Uh, amounts to around 20% of annual pediatric ED visits national uh, countrywide. There is a lot of variability in knowledge about fever in caretakers or what they perceive fever to be, regarding temperature, the way to take it, you know, just um, about what fever is in, um, in the general. And our risk of serious bacterial infection, or SBI slash bacteremia, still remains low. Risk obviously increases with younger age and additional factors. And there is no clear consensus about TD management of fever in the healthy infant. So fever, um, just talking about the variability you know, in perception by uh, caretakers, there was a paper uh, in pediatric emergency care about detecting fever in young infants. And uh, basically what it concluded was that the sensitivity and specificity of perceived and temporal artery detection of fever was similar at 91 and 79 percent, uh, and 83 and 86 respectively. Febrile PESIFI readings uh, were, uh, had a little bit of a higher sensitivity. Therefore, rectal thermometry must remain standard of care in infants less than three months. So if you have mothers who come in, you know, who take it like an axillary temperature or a temporal temperature, you must always, you know, educate them or at least you know, do a rectal temperature in the so the, this talk I'm going to divide into three sections, which is you know basically fever in the little infant, less than 28 day old, what we call neonatal fever, 29 to 60 days, and then greater than 60 up to 90 days. Uh, and then we'll discuss the variability in practice part. So less than 28 days, neonatal fever is an obvious complaint. So risk of bacteremia is estimated to be 9 to 10% in a full-term baby. It increases slightly, about 12 to 15%, if the baby is preterm or have any additional risk factors in the uh, pre- or postnatal period. Clinical scoring systems and history or examination are not reliable predictors for bacteremia or SPI in this age group. 
Uh, thus, most experts recommend a framework of expected tests and management guidance. Neonatal fever, the recommendation currently by the AAP is a complete sepsis workup. CBC, what, what that means is a CBC blood culture, UA urine culture, CSF cell counts, CSF cultures, and chest x-ray. Uh, you guys might have also heard about the new additions uh, talking about CRP and procalcitonin. That's not yet you know, in the recommendations, but you know it's kind of uh, beginning to gain favor since it's more sensitive and it, you know, it has a better um, area under the curve uh, for um, uh, evaluation of uh, SBIs. Antibiotics are recommended, ampicillin and cefotaxin, and uh, you can also consider ampicillin and gentamicin. They also talk about considering antivirals in cyclovir if the baby is less than 21 day old, maternal history of genital herpes, mucocutaneous lesions on exam, if uh, the baby has seizures in the neonatal period, or if the baby is irritable or ill, or Ill appearing. Disposition, the current recommendation is for admission to the inpatient floor, antibiotics until blood culture is negative. Do not discharge the baby home even if the follow up is closed. Because the baby really needs to be monitored. So these are uh, basically the recommendations you know, by, um, uh, by the experts. However, is there variability in practice? And I was actually surprised to find this study because they looked at basically 36 different children's hospitals and uh, which, who reviewed like 41,890 units. Uh, tw uh, 2253 had fever out of these. And not everybody is basically doing the complete sepsis workup. There's 3% the, um, 3% of um, past, uh, you know, um, patients were still discharged from the PZD without receiving any recommended testing or treatment. So um, you know, this is basically just to highlight that you know, variability in practice exists. And if you guys you know, went to practice somewhere and you see you know, things differently, just keep in mind that, you know, that this is not really the recommendation, but there is variability. There is wide variation in adherence to recommended management of febrile neonates. High rates of serious infection in admitted patients but low return rates for risk infections in discharge patients suggest additional studies needed to understand variation from current recommendations. So pretty much uh, there's need to be more. Long story short, as far as for us, you know, complete sepsis workup is recommended, initiate antibiotics, <coughs> consider antivirals, admission to the inpatient unit, and uh, pretty much you know you take it from there. Then we come to the 29 to 60 day old, which is the very gray zone where most of us are we don't know what to do, so we'll come back to this later. Because <laughs> you know, there's a very, you know, it's like balancing, and it's you know, you don't want to do unnecessary testing and procedures, yet you don't want to be missing something, especially you know, serious bacterial infection, which can really, really be fatal to the child. So uh, we will come back to the 60, uh, 20, 90, 60 days later. 60 to 90 day old, uh, the odds are in your favor, pretty much. Detailed history and good physical exam can aid your workup and actually are very useful. So, you know, getting a detailed evaluation. I mean, it's always important to take a good history, even in a less than 28 day old, but, you know, it's just kind of going to be very hard to um, make a decision based on that. Risk of bacteremia or serious bacterial illness is low. Vaccines and herd immunity are protected. And a risk of bacteremia is older to than in older. So it's kind of similar, you know, over the, over three months. So pretty much two months and above, the risk of bacteremia is the same, which is very, very low. And we'll talk about the percentages later. The other thing is also by this age, most babies, you know, have received the two-month-old vaccines or like the first set of vaccines. Again, identify ill-appearing babies based on history and exam. So if you look at the prevalence of serious bacterial infection by age, you know, and this is basically age and days and uh, the, the percentage. So 0 to 14, that means the first two weeks of life, 10%, which is kind of which is pretty high. And then really after 29 days, which is 29 to 60, it goes down to 1% and uh, you know 0.2%. And pretty much after 60 days, it's 1 over 100. That means a 0.01% risk of SBI. And again, this is occult bacteria in a well-appearing baby. <coughs> again, uh, what does the literature say about you know what are the basic, uh, when they looked it up, you know, what are the causes of um, fever? Mostly 84% have some sort of like a viral illness. So 9.5% had UTI, 6% uh, you know, pneumonia, aseptic meningitis, uh, otitis media, and really 0.5% bacteremia. So the risk of bacteremia is kind of very, um, pretty significantly low after 60 years of life. Okay. <clears throat> so basically the conclusion that 
they reached is, you know, they, if it's like 0.25% after three months of age. So three to 36 months, you can pretty much put them in the same bracket and risk of bacteremia is very, very low after. So what is the recommended workup? So if the baby is ill appearing, the recommendation is still to do a CBC, blood culture, UA, urine culture, consider chest x-ray if pulmonary symptoms, and consider lumbar puncture if the baby is ill appearing, looks meningitic, you know, there's complaints from the parents, has not received <coughs> vaccines, and uh, you can start with clerical antibiotics. Well appearing babies, uh, they talk about pretty much, you can, you know, it's up to the physician who's taking care of the baby, and, um, you know, you must consider UA and urine culture, like Satya specified earlier, you know, um, if there is ob no obvious source identity. Long story short, in the well-appearing infant, the risk of, uh, which is, you know, this is more than um, three months old pretty much, uh, in, in the well-appearing infant, the risk of bacteremia or serious bacterial infection is equivalent to an older infant. Um, history and examination should guide evaluation and management. So let's get back to the, you know, the gray zone, what we talked about, the 29 to the 60 day old, and estimating the risk, and how much you're supposed to do, and what you should do. That's when, you know, so there's no consensus guidelines. There is a lower incidence, like we looked at the percentages, there is a lower incidence of SBI or bacteremia, and history and examination may aid in evaluation. Most infants may not have received their first set of vaccines, and this kind of, you know, makes the picture a little bit confusing, because you're like, you know, they haven't received vaccines, so should I, you know, do a little bit more on this baby, you know, but the baby appears well, so you kind of, um, kind of, Defer to different protocols. Uh, we'll go through the different protocols, you know, for fever in this age group. So the first one is the Philadelphia Fever Protocol, basically looking at you know, all children from 29 days to 60 days. They recommend obtaining a CBC blood culture, UA urine culture, and a bedside glucose on all babies that come with fever, um, you know, well appearing babies. You're, uh, you should be able to identify low risk. So basically, the you know things that that you know that would entail would be full-term baby greater than 37 weeks of gestation, no prolonged NICU stay, no chronic medical problems, no systemic antibiotics within 72 hours, well appearing, easily consolable, and no infections, you know, uh, mastitis, no other obvious bone, joint, skin infections on exam. They also talk about if you know the baby has just received vaccines, then you know you should be. Um, it's not mentioned there, but when you look at the text, they talk about you know that it automatically goes into the doors. <coughs> Based on the labs, the white count, you know, of greater than 5,000 and less than 15,000, and uh, the balanced to neutrophil counts of greater than, you know, zero, so, sorry, that was 0.2%. Uh, urine, so UA, the WBC less than 10, and negative gram stain, and chest x-ray if negative for infiltrate. So basically, you know, the hist so this, these clinical features and this lab, you know, will put the child at low risk. So management, you know, then you divide them into low risk and high risk. Low risk, no antimicrobials, discharge, and a sure close follow-up. So follow-up is key as far as you know. They should be able to have follow-up within 24 hours. High risk, they talk about, you know, performed lung culture. So, you know, they have a very, very significantly elevated white count, or their urine is positive, and they think, you know, the baby doesn't look well, is preterm. Any, anything that falls out of this low risk category, your, you know, performed LP, antimicrobials, consider an admission. The other one, you know, that we guys probably heard of is the Rochester Protocol. Again, looking at babies less than 60 day old, so 29 to 60 again, obtain pretty much safe CBC blood culture, UA urine culture, identify low risk. Again, no perinatal antibiotics, no hospitalizations, no unexplained hyperbilirubinemia, and born at term gestation. So if, you know, you're preterm, you automatically go into a high risk. Uh, you know, you have to uh, think more about doing this. Low risk as far as labs, pretty much similar except that instead of the, um, the, the um, they look at the band count instead of the percentages and then uh, the UA less than 5, uh, less, sorry, less than 10 WBCs for high power field and if they have diarrhea then you know, you're supposed to get a stool uh, exam and then do a cell count and if um, you know, the white count should be less than 5 for high power field. No evidence of soft tissue, skin, joint, bone infection, similar to um, the Philadelphia. Management, again, high risk and low risk. So high risk, you know, you are um, consider lumbar puncture, antibiotics, and admission, because the, all there, you know, have an increased risk of having uh, bacteria. And low risk, you can discharge home within 24 hours. Well. The other one, you know, the last protocol that I'm gonna discuss is the Boston protocol, which is like from 29 to 90 day old. 
the most the Boston Global pretty much recommends doing a full sepsis workup on any baby that's you know less than three months of age, comes in with a fever without an identifiable source or you know um, obviously not well appearing. CBC blood culture, UA urine culture, CSF cell counts, CSF cultures, and chest X-ray if pulmonary symptoms are signs. Then you identify low risk. You know, um, you know, no immunizations or antimicrobials uh, within the last 48 hours. No dehydration. No pure soft tissue bone infection. And you know, they also talk about which is interesting. I think caretaker. If, you know, if you're able to reach them, available by telephone, you can contact them throughout. Then you know, automatically baby goes into the lower risk. Again, based on the labs, white count of less than 20,000. Uh, CSF white count of less than 10 per milliliter cube. UA less than 10 WBCs per high part field and no infiltrates on chest radiograph. Based on that, you know, as far as management, um, they talk about high risk antibiotics and admit, of course. But low risk, you know, which is different from the other protocols that we went through, is pretty much giving <coughs> them a dose of IM set triaxone, 50 milligram per kilogram discharge in 24 hour follow-up. Uh, and mind you, they have so I want to just bring out this um, point is that <coughs> Sorry. That they have they give such trisome, but they have tapped you know the child before. So you know usually they talk about you know don't give antibiotics if you're really not tapping a less than three month old, but you're like concerned for sepsis because you know then that might kind of make the CSF culture sterile and you know that raises um, more questions. So long story short, uh, again no consensus guidelines for less than uh, you know for this age group, for 29 to 60 day old. There's different protocols in play, you know, we can, you know, it depends on the physician preference, also on the institutional settings, you know, you kind of <coughs> adhere to what protocol. I think most of us, um, you know, we'll talk about that later, but most of us don't tap less than three month old, and you know, the attendees are here, and you can tell me, you know, you think differently. I mean, we do have a fever at less than three month old, you know, over 28 days, um, the current practice is really not, you know, getting a CSF. Identify high risk versus low risk based on all the factors that I told you. Again, in, in all these, you know, all these criteria, all these protocols, if the baby's got immunizations, you know, or vaccines, you know, on the day, and the baby looks really well, they are kind of automatically going to the low risk category. Uh, most recommend basic laboratory workup and 24-hour follow-up. So I think this is kind of what we do here too, like in getting like a partial sepsis workup, CBC blood culture, UA urine culture, and then a 24-hour follow-up plus minus chest X-ray, depending if they have some pulmonary. Most protocols do not perform a lumbar puncture in low risk individuals. So then we're going to talk about two, uh, spe uh, you know, different kind of you know special situations when patients are on antibiotics. So um, you know the the biggest risk with you know when patients are on antibiotics is that serious bacterial infection may be masked by negative culture results. Now, how long the antibiotic <coughs> duration, dose, all that you know comes into play. However, these patients should not be classified as low risk. So if you have a baby that comes in with a very high fever, you know, over 29 day old, and you know, you, the baby otherwise looks okay, but you know, has been on antibiotics for five days, then you know, you kind of have to have your index of suspicion a little bit higher for working up a baby versus you know, just saying that this is a purely low uh, So you know, if you are um, you know concerned about the baby in any way, you, know, you should definitely consider admission or observation in the hospital. Neonates. You know, who've been on, I mean, they should not really be on antibiotics at home, but you, you know, they talk about that in literature. If there is, you know, any neonate that comes in, you know, is basically on antibiotics at home for any reason, you should really, you know, coming in with fever, you should consider admission and treatment. And of course, of course, that's as well. What about when they have concomitant viral infections? So this one comes in, like, you know, very commonly, we face with this, right? So, you know, the baby comes in, has a little bit of, you know, cold, URI symptoms, so presence of upper respiratory symptoms does not rule in or rule out a serious bacterial infection. So you can pretty much, you know, not, I mean, the risk is getting, it's definitely lower, but, uh, you know, you have to kind of, you know, still keep that in your vision. It's not going to be, you know, 100% that's going to be no that. <coughs> so, you know, the two common ones that we talk about always are, you know, influenza and RSV. Uh, incidence of, so, you know, if you look at the incidence of, uh, you know, um, Bacterial infection, serious bacterial infection, you know, in babies with bronchiolitis, it's actually 1.1 percent compared to you know 1.1 uh, to 7 percent versus 10 to 17 percent in patients without bronchiolitis. So you know, it is lower, it's there, but it's definitely lower. Thus, you must you know weigh observation versus a detailed evaluation. 
So there is a study uh, which was uh, published in Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal. You know, they talk about the same thing, you know, that there is a significantly lower rate of serious bacterial infection was noted in 123 infants who were influenza positive compared with 721 infants who were influenza negative. So if you look at the overall percentage, it's 2.5% versus 11.7% for patients who have positive influenza. So, uh, you know, if, a C if this, so basically what they came out with was if the CBC urine analysis do not suggest bacterial infection, lumbar puncture can be omitted in a well-appearing infant who is older than 28 days of age, has a positive rapid influenza test, and no evidence of bacterial infection on physical exam. Same thing for uh, bronchiolitis. You know, maybe looking at RSV, there's like a couple of other um, viruses in this included, but you know, mostly, you know, the big cohort is from the RSV kids. So, you know, again, SVI uh, in 9.6% infants without bronchiolitis and 2.2% with bronchiolitis. So, obviously, the risk is, you know, it goes down significantly. So, in conclusion, fever in the newborn period is obviously not a good sign and you have to be worried. Current recommendations advocate complete sepsis workup and initiation of antibiotics and antivirals with admission uh, to the inpatient unit in, le in units less than 28 days of life. No clear consensus guidelines in 29 to 90 days. However, different protocols are in play depending on your institutional policy and depending on your level of comfort, you kind of uh, have to manage them. Risk of SBI is significantly low after 90 days, like you looked at, it's like almost 0.01%. And clinical judgment and follow-up hierarchy. Any questions? What did you guys end up doing to the baby with the... Uh, oh, okay. So this was a hypothetical case. This wasn't really a patient, so we just made it up. But I mean, in my experience, if the baby looks really well, you know, if I uh, just got immunization, I would 